There are 7.8 billion people alive in the world today, and every day 184,000 punch their ticket out of here while even more drop in. The earliest Homo sapien was estimated to be living around 200,000 years ago. Clearly um, a Cardinals fan by the looks of it. So. We've been at this a while, and there have been a metric ton of us. The chances that you're living a truly unique life are astronomically small. However, there is one man. One man that's been barred by a court from wearing a costume in four California counties, revolutionized dressing and acting like an animal during sporting events, becoming an even bigger legend than most of the players that set foot on the field. One man who nearly created an international incident with Russia and has managed to be sued by Barney the Dinosaur. If you asked that man, he'd say he's not a man at all, for he is a chicken, and he's one bad mother clucker. <laughs> To the dubs. We're going to start a new tradition today and dedicate today's video to one of YouTube's many channels that has more subscribers than us. Today's sponsor is Maya Bridge, whose four most popular videos are 10 hours of paint drying, 10 hours of coughing, 10 hours of watching grass growing, and 10 hours of jingling keys. For his efforts, he's racked up 71.9 thousand subscribers to my 442. I implore you, do not stand for this injustice and get yourself a free subscription to our channel. Along with hitting that thumb and leaving us some comments, it's the most surefire way of making the dugs a thing, which is the most surefire way that you will receive the highest quality of baseball stories and jokes, as everything we do here is a means to those ends. Ted Giannoulis was born three times, once at a student-run radio station at San Diego State University, once here, which we'll get back to, and once in a Canadian hospital in August of 1953, which I, uh, I didn't look for video footage for. For, but to be honest, we won't be spending much time on the actual man behind the chicken. For one thing, my initial attempts of tracking down a picture of Ted didn't pan out. Apparently the man is the chicken and the chicken is the man and he doesn't take photos outside the suit. So we'll skip the Canadian birth and start with birth number two. In 1974, our boy Ted is hanging out with his friends at a small student-run radio station at SDSU and loves rock and roll, so when one of the station reps of a larger station in KGB offers up a volunteer opportunity, both him and all of his friends jump at the opportunity. Quote unquote, no questions asked. In a move that seemed to be questioning their enthusiasm, the station rep warns that the gig is only going to pay $2 an hour. No problem, they're in. Well, yeah, but it's not a traditional role. No problem, they're in. And yeah, but one of you is gonna have to wear a chicken suit. Now there was a pause here, as one does when faced with donning a chicken suit, but they still bought in. Ted was selected for chicken duty based on his diminutive size. He only stood five foot four and weighed 120 pounds, which to be fair, would be an absolute unit of a chicken. However, for a human, it was small enough to comfortably fit inside the smallest chicken costume. And so he was hired and started the very next day. The gig was a promotional stunt at the San Diego Zoo that lasted 10 days. He performed well, and when the 10 days were up, Ted suggested that they keep the chicken clucking by sending it to the Padres opening night. You know, for the good of the station. Reminds me how I jumped into management's office as soon as I heard there was a travel opportunity to Puerto Rico and said, look, you know I'm the man for this. Who better than me to give a presentation on the marketing strategy for, checking the project specs for the first time, feminine hygiene. I actually convinced them, by the way, and uh, I learned a whole lot of stuff that I wish I hadn't. Ted convinces KGB as well, and it's off to the Padres game. He's a hit. The opening day appearance turns into five years of chicken-centric promotional work with the radio station, including, but not exclusive to, appearances at Padres games. Fans begin to take notice. Attendance doubled in his first year of appearances. They let him onto the field to entertain the crowd while there were breaks in the game. Before he was a Padre, Tony Gwynn and hell, many other fans owned up to the fact that the main draw for them coming to the game was coming to see what the chicken would get up to. He was the station's golden egg, taking KGB radio from fifth in the area to first. So, we haven't mentioned the radio's call sign of KGB yet, and I'm sure it's sticking out like a sore thumb. No, it had nothing to do with the secretive Russian agency, but don't tell that to the Russians. One of the events he was hired to work was an exhibition hockey game between the San Diego Mariners and the world champion Russian hockey team. Well, when you've got the Russians over and they're not in the know, it proved to be a bad idea to have a red chicken emblazoned with the letters KGB reportedly delivering hexes to the team and quote unquote mooning them. It served as a big enough insult that the Russian team didn't come out at the proposed start of the game. It was a 20 minute delay. They wanted the chicken evicted from the premises, but eventually relented when somebody explained the radio station to them and the fact that 
it would make a more newsworthy story if the chicken was in fact removed from the building. The game went off without a hitch and the Russians won handily after going down early and don't worry, Ted's still clucking and hasn't slipped and fallen out of a 20 story window onto a knife. So it was all going great until Ted's ego starts to get a bit big for its shell. He was allowed to book his own appearances as the KGB chicken, but the KGB part of that statement is important. In 1979, Ted had the pluck to appear as the chicken at a nationally televised basketball game without the KGB branding. Well, the radio station didn't heed the advice of not looking a gifted chicken in the beak and just straight up fired him and sued him for a quarter of a million dollars for breach of contract. Ted appeared in court with a paper bag over his head that had two holes cut out for his eyes and a yellow feather taped to the top, signifying yes, he was the chicken suit man, man is the chicken, etc. He didn't have to pay the money, but it was ruled that he could not appear in the famous chicken outfit in the counties of San Diego, Imperial, Riverside, and Orange. That's fine, when life gives you lemons, you make piccata. Can't wear the famous chicken outfit? That's fine, he made his own damn chicken costume and vowed to return with a vengeance. KGB made a legal run at this as well, which spawned this fantastic vision of a judge having to compare the similarity of two chickens to gauge whether it was infringement. The judge ruled that the costumes were different enough and that no man or organization shall hold a monopoly on chicken costumes. He closed the proceedings by saying, He, he said he wants to put this to nest once and for all. To get his claw back through the front door, he offered to appear for free at Padres games, which the San Diego brass was over the moon about. They were well aware of the chicken's popularity, but a man's gotta eat and Ted saw an opportunity. He'd appear for free, but would like a performance-based bonus if he could draw a larger than average home crowd. I imagine at this point that nothing short of an all-out guffaw broke out in the offices. The 1979 Padres were pretty bad. They finished the season with 68 wins. They had Ozzie Smith, yeah, that Ozzie Smith. You know why you don't know that? It's because Ozzie Smith sucked in 1979, slashing 211, 260, 262. Dave Winfield was all right, netting out at 34 home runs and serving as the only Padre with a batting average north of 300. Their catcher Gene Tennis had 20 home runs, but those were the only two guys in double digits in home runs. Another thing about Tennis, I think he hated being a catcher. I think he was convinced he was a speed guy attempting to steal eight bases. He uh, got two of them, so yeah. Collectively, these guys aren't much of a draw, so have at it, chicken. So Ted knew he had a heck of a task ahead of him. He knew he'd have to spread the word of his return to stand out from the general malaise that sounded a sub-mediocre team. And what Ted did was downright theater. He started promoting. He branded the event the Grand Rehatching and they began putting a giant egg on display in the left field concourse. The hype for the return of the chicken was at an absolute fever pitch and then it got even hotter. The night before the Grand Rehatching was to occur, the egg had been stolen. Rumors immediately began flying that it was the act of the KGB, Ted's former place of employment. As it turns out, it was just some fans that had hidden in the bathrooms after a game and had outlasted security and made off with the egg after hours. No worries though, they agreed to return it, but they had some ransom demands. Number one, no charges were to be pressed. Number two, they would receive 12 tickets to the grand hatching game. And number three, because they needed additional help making bad decisions, apparently they wanted all the beer they could drink. Shockingly, they actually got some of what they wanted, but they topped out at four tickets and $20 for beer. And so it was hatching time. Ted was wheeled out inside the giant styrofoam egg atop a Brinks security truck and lowered by the entirety of the San Diego Padres team to the field in a scene that was most likely 100% of the source of inspiration behind the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man stopping a train scene. Oh, and just if you're keeping track, our boy Ted has now beaten Lady Gaga to both being carried around in an egg and wearing the carcass of an animal by three decades. Nice one, Ted. So the egg gently touches down. And then... There's movement! The egg begins to roll around while the theme of 2001 A Space Odyssey begins to play over the loudspeakers. Pure theater, I told you. Only not quite. The egg rolling was actually the chicken kicking as hard as he could in an attempt to break out. Apparently he hadn't practiced this part of the act, which I'm sure was hindered by the egg theft. He had been in the egg for 15 minutes at this point and everyone in on it began to panic. But alas, eventually outburst the chicken and the San Diego chicken was reborn back into the world. Now his own bird and a not an indentured servant to the KGB. A 10 minute standing ovation followed and for his part, Ted was cut a check for north of $40,000 for the huge crowd that turned out for the night. The chicken became a huge deal in San Diego, something a different Ted began to take notice of. Ted Turner, owner of the Atlanta Braves, offered San Diego a backup catcher in exchange for the chicken. I couldn't find confirmation about which player it was, but please oh please let's assume it was Bruce Benedict as his nickname was Eggs, after the popular breakfast dish of Eggs Benedict. If we could confirm that, however, we would have started the video with that story. You know, 
It would have come first, the chicken for the eggs. The Padres replied that the chicken was its own fowl and they couldn't trade something they didn't own. So Ted Turner countered with offering the chicken $50,000 to come over to Atlanta, which he turned down. Turner, who even at this time was filthy rich and not one to be turned away, doubled it to an even 100K, a TV show, and an office next to Hank Aaron. Now, being 1979, it bears noting that this would have actually been a larger salary than several of the players on the team, as Baseball Reference has Dick Ruthven at 65K and Rod Gilbreth at 60K. In the end, the chicken decided to stay in San Diego, aided by a public outpouring of support from the city, including personal entreaties from the mayor and Pete Wilson. In the end, it was all kind of a moot point. When all is said and done, the chicken would appear all over the country and beyond, averaging 250 appearances a year. He got that TV show as well. The chicken was a staple on the baseball bunch, which was meant to be an educational show for kids, teaching them the fundamentals of baseball. It starred Johnny Bench as the coach of a group of eight kids that made up the baseball team. Chicken made nine. One half featured the show's regulars, including a turbaned Tom Lee Lasorda playing the dugout wizard, who extolled many things to the kids, including the importance of letting the manager argue your points with the umpire so you don't get ejected. The other half of the show featured the guest appearance of a major league star, including Ozzie Smith telling the kids about how he sucked that one time in 1979, Dusty Baker teaching kids why pitch counts don't matter, Pete Rose on what this blonde kid will go for on the black market, and Ted Williams telling the kids how his head will one day be severed and cryogenically stored in a can. Quick note on Ted Williams, actually. What in the hell is going on there? In making sure that I was citing the right player when it comes to cryogenic freezing, I did a quick perusal and found this little blurb. The operation was completed and Williams' head and body were preserved separately. The head is stored in a steel can filled with liquid nitrogen. It has been shaved, drilled with holes, and accidentally cracked 10 times, the magazine said. We talking about his head being cracked 10 times? Might be time to get rid of Ted's head. I feel like it's that chicken breast you bought seven days ago and are kinda on the fence about. Even though you know you're not gonna be around for the next three days to cook it, just toss it in the trash and call it a day. It was inevitable that Ted Giannullis became a star. He puts everything to his act, sometimes a little too much. He was once sued by Don Schultz for $2 million. He claims that he separated his shoulder while fending off the chicken during an exhibition game. He claimed that after he had hit a home run, the chicken had grabbed him, causing him to fall while Ted countered that Don had just tripped over his large feet. Now, I can't find video footage of the incident, but it exists. It was shown to a jury, and the jury decided to rule in favor of the chicken. There's also the fact that, as we mentioned at the top of the video, Ted was 5'4 and 120 pounds soaking wet, taking on the 6'4 inch Don Schultz, who baseball reference has at 100 pounds north of the chicken. He was suing due to the fact that separated shoulder reportedly caused him to miss seven starts and alter his delivery for the remainder of his career, causing him to lose control over some of his pitches. Now, all of this legal stuff happened in 1985. The supposed tripping incident was in 1981, which I would have thought was outside the statute of limitations for chicken-based crime. It's possible he was pressured to do this by the Cubs or Indians, the two squads he had played for at that point, as he had turned in an ERA of 523 thus far in the years of 1983 and 84, and they were looking for something, anything to blame their bad signing on. Don just wanted not to be known as the guy that was tackled by the chicken. Well, for one, suing a chicken for $2 million is a bad start for flying under the radar. And two, well, let me tell you a story for number two. In 1985, Dieter Lors, a photographer, was found dead in his apartment with homemade electrodes attached to his testicles and a phallic-shaped gag wedged into his mouth. If you were asked about this guy tomorrow, would you mention that he took nice pictures? He was also sued by Barney the Dinosaur in 1997. One of the chicken's gags involved, quote, punching, flipping, standing on, and otherwise assaulting the putative Barney, which I think most parents wanted to do during this era. The lawsuit was thrown out on the grounds that it was a parody in that, you know, he wasn't actually assaulting Barney the Dinosaur or trying to launch his own educational children's show, though you could argue that he was teaching a very valuable lesson of always watching your back. The lawsuit being dropped allowed him to continue his act, though, to be fair, he'd switch up his acts of violence between this and assaulting a dummy meant to resemble the aforementioned Don Schultz while Dummy Schultz threatened to sue him. There was also an attempted lawsuit against the Dayton Dragons due to having the chicken entertain while the ball was in play, resulting in a fan, let's call her Karen, being struck by a foul ball. The court once again ruled in favor of the chicken, claiming two hands, Karen, you gotta make that catch. There was one successful lawsuit against the chicken where he was forced to pay a Bulls cheerleader $300,000 when an ill-advised tumbling act reportedly injured her jaw and elbow, forcing her to give up her spot on the Bulls squad. The other half of this was that she was well enough seven months later to perform a backflip at a cartwheel en route to winning a barroom dance contest. Now keep in mind, this is not an expose. I wasn't there for any of these injuries, nor could I find video evidence of most of them, barring the Barney beatdown, which 
Let's see a little bit more of that. Fantastic. I'm just a random dude doing internet research to support his comedy-centric baseball story YouTube channel. But I guess one thing is clear. When you get the chicken, you're getting all of the chicken. He's not going to hold back. Ted is all in. It's that level of dedication that has made the San Diego chicken a legend and now an idol of mine. This enthusiasm has carried him all the way to the Hall of Fame, or at least his suit, as it was sent for display in Cooperstown. I'm going to close this out with words directly from the chicken's beak on that matter. I'm thrilled that my costume is now enshrined, Ted said. The Hall of Fame is about stats, not lore. My Hall of Fame is getting thousands of people to laugh whenever I perform. Having said that, Cooperstown has a player's wing and a broadcaster's wing. Maybe one day they'll have a chicken wing. That does it for us today. Once again, if you enjoy what we do here, hitting that thumbs up and getting a free subscription to the channel is the most surefire way to turn the dugs into a thing. If you're interested in other baseball bird mashups, why don't you check out this video we did about the time a Yankees ball player challenged an ostrich to an eating contest. It's a weird niche to have become an expert on, but here we are. As always, I've been Johnny Paprika, hoping all of your balls are fair and all of your wood is good. Good night, everybody.